I'd just like to begin by asking each of my friends to just introduce yourself, say a few words about how you came to know Dan, and a little bit about the nature of your history before we kind of get into specifics. Uh, I'm Jean Johnson. I worked at Public Agenda from 1980 until I still work for Public Agenda <laughs> part of the time, so many, many, many years. And uh, I joined Public Agenda. I was hired by uh, John Immervar and some other people at Public Agenda. And uh, you sent me up to see Dan. And uh, Dan, uh, being a uh, wonderful uh, person who just is not a bureaucratic thinker, offered me the job while I was sitting there. And being in my younger days, I was so excited. I accepted the job <laughs> while I was sitting there. So that's how we met. <laughs> So I'm John Immervar, and I'm Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Villanova University. And I was kind of a philosophy professor looking for something to do in New York for, I thought it would be a semester. I didn't realize it would be the rest of my life. Uh, <laughs> and kind of got involved with Public Agenda for a semester, a year, back and forth. And I'll tell a little bit about how these two got involved maybe a bit later. But, and created so many lifelong experiences and friends. It's so great to be here. I'm John Doble. I'm a senior associate now with the Kettering Foundation. Over the years, I worked with Dan in many capacities. Uh, first was I joined uh, Yankelovich, Skelly, and White the, uh, um, in 1977. Uh, YSW was, at that time, along with Gallup and Harris, one of the world's premier uh, public opinion research organizations. Then I joined uh, Public Agenda when uh, I was hired by Gene Johnson and John Irivar. Uh, uh, I was there for 13 years. Later, I formed my own consulting group where I worked with Public Agenda and the Kettering Foundation, National Issues Forums, and with Dan on a couple of projects, including uh, one in uh, 2004 where Dan and I worked uh, for John Kerry. Uh, then after 11 years, I rejoined Public Agenda, and now I'm a senior associate at Kettering. Where okay. I work, yeah, right. I just right. I'll just finish. Oh, or, sorry. Or, or just you ever, hesitated for a second. Ever so, so. quickly. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to cut it. Well, I, I, <laughs> go, I, go, go, go. Well, I I, I worked uh, worked with Kettering nearly my entire career because, as, as David said, that the, there was a, a unique bond of friendship and mutual respect and intellectual kinship between uh, the Kettering Foundation and uh, Public Agenda. Right. And David Matthews and Dan. So Yankelovich, Skelly White, Public Agenda, Kettering, all sort of represented yep. here in terms of, of you know, major uh, uh, um, uh, involvement uh, um, for, for Dan. Um, now, uh, with, with that, you know, I'm, I'm going I'm to suggest we're all reasonably bright people. On this. You know, we, we, we probably think we're reasonably bright people up on the stage. But at some point, I know we all realize that Dan is, there's, there's another level happening <laughs> with Dan, <laughs> kind of another level of, of, of insight and, uh, and sort of penetrating insight. That, you know, if you hang out with, if you, if you had the opportunity to hang out with the guy, it kind of, it struck you at some point, usually sooner rather than later, that there's some kind of extraordinary uh, intellect or, or, or way of uh, attacking problems going on here. And I want to invite if you if you have some kind, if you have that story, and I think we've all experienced that somehow, uh, um, I'd be interested to hear <laughs> how that came across to you. Can um, I start? Oh, oh please go ahead. I'd like to start with one that actually has to do with these people here. So, so for a reason that I only understood later, Dan had hired me to work at Public Agenda, and one of the things I had to do was hire a, a full time person at Public Agenda, and I knew nothing about what I was doing, but I interviewed a whole bunch of people, and I had these two candidates. And, you know, they both had rather different skills. And I, I came to Dan, and I said, all right, I have two finalists. He'd never met either one of them. And like this and that. And they said, there's this man and this woman, and, and uh, let's hire the man. He's perfect. He's great. He's, and Dan said, you have done so well. I'm so <laughs> proud. Hire the woman. <laughs> and I said, but I just, he said, I know, but you were great. You gave me all the information I needed. And I thought, what information did he need? I didn't get this. But, but then, um, well, then I sort of got it. So then I had to hire a consultant to have the skills that the woman didn't have. And so, which were public agenda. She was like, she could do anything. But, um, 
So she was clueless on right, public opinion right. research. So yeah. then I interviewed a whole bunch of public uh, public opinion people, and I, I kind of really didn't care for any of them. And then I talked to one of Dan's colleagues at Yankee Skelly and White, and I said, I can't find anybody. He said, I can't think of a thing. I've told you all my people. And he said, but you know, there is a guy. He's brilliant public opinion, but he really didn't like working for the firm here. He dropped out. He's writing a novel. And I said, what's his name? He's hired. <laughs> <laughs> and that was John. And, and you know, the person who he went back to Dan, he said, who is this Immervar guy? He just, uh, you know, he, I just told him about John, and he wanted to hire him. But I think what I finally learned was that Dan collected people. And he was interested in the person, not the position, which, of course, is how he got me in there, because I had no idea what I was doing either. But as you look around this room, you see so many people that Dan, you know, Larry Kagan was Nicole's high school teacher. And he <laughs> said, this guy has something. So he, he, he just drew people to him that he thought could make some special contribution. And so many of us have been touched by that, I think. Uh, I don't ever recall a moment when I didn't know that Dan was brilliant. I think it was like awe at first sight with that. So I, I didn't, uh, there was no learning curve in, in determining that Dan was brilliant. But I was thinking about, in fact, we were talking, uh, you know, shortly after Dan died, about things Dan used to say. We call it Danisms. And um, are, are there two of them. And I think they just say a lot about his thinking about the American public and the democracy. So one of the things he used to say is, you can never go wrong underestimating what people know. And this would come up when we were, you know, we're trying to maybe write a survey or do some materials on like nuclear testing or trade policy, something where it's so complex. And here you are trying to you know, write some question that will be clear or write some paragraph that people can read. And you know, we're saying, well, is this simple enough and simple enough? And Dan would say, well, you can never go wrong underestimating what people know. Because he knew, he was very savvy. He knew that a lot of people aren't watching the news. They forgot their high school civics lessons. Um, you know, they aren't watching PBS. And he, uh, you know, he, he thought that people needed context. They needed lay of the land. But he really fought against this idea that our job was to make people mini experts. He said, you're not going to make them mini experts. What he really valued was people's pragmatisms. And he wanted to hear about their daily lives, their lived experience. He thought this is what they bring to the table. This is why we need to understand and talk to the American public. And you know, he used to say that you can get a much better idea of whether a policy will succeed or fail by asking typical Americans about it, how it's going to impact their lives, whether it's going to work for them, than by going to think tank experts you know, with their trends and their charts on the wall. And he was very, very respectful of the knowledge and the experience that Americans bring to the table. Uh, so the other phrase uh, that he used to say uh, was, it's important what people give lip service to. And this would be, we'd be doing a survey or writing something about you know, freedom of expression or poverty or homelessness where people will, you know, they'll agree, oh, yes, you know, we want to do something about homelessness. And then you ask about the, the homeless shelter in your neighborhood, and it's, well, no, no, no. And so probably me, I would be sitting around saying, well, people are just giving lip service to it. And Dan, I think if you know Dan, you know how sometimes when he's really trying to make a point, his, his voice would go up just a tad. And he would say, it's important what people give lip service to. Yeah. And you know, I think what he meant by that was he had enormous respect for public values and their role in our democracy. And he uh, you know, believed that uh, you know, all of us have our aspirations, and we don't quite live up to them. You know, at one point, I think some of you know he developed the learning curve, and there were seven stages of how people cope with an issue. And there's, you know, you learn about it, and you wrestle with the choices, and you try to, you know, uh, fight your ambivalences and work out the tensions and all these things. But six and seven, six was when you had an idea of where you wanted to go. You had an ideal. A six was, and then seven was when you actually do it. And so we all have aspirations that we don't quite live up to, but Dan thought those were very important. And one rule he kept you say a lot, he said that it, any policy which does not match the values of the American people 
and is not pragmatic and work in their daily lives is doomed to fail. Doesn't matter how good an idea is, it has to have those two criteria. So this was very much you know, a part of his thinking. And I, I just think his, his respect for Americans, now you hear people want to message the American public or divvy it up you know, into segments so you can get your policy in there. You know, Dan wanted us to listen to people. And I, I just think that I, you know, I, I hope we can continue to say that for him because that was his message. Uh, I, I, okay, I'll, I'll go next. I have a, I have a couple of stories. Um, they're not personal stories. They're stories about Dan's thinking. Um, and the first occurred when I was at YSW, Yankelovich, Skelly, and White, where I saw um, the development of one of Dan's signature insights about the evolution of public opinion. At YSW, Dan came up with something he called at the time the mushiness index. Uh, Greg Martyr, my friend Greg Martyr, uh, who's here and worked with me at YSW, he was one of the researchers who worked with Dan on this. Now, as we all know, Dan could really turn a phrase, but the mushiness index was not one of his best, <laughs> to, say, to say the very least. It was a series, I, I believe, of five questions, and it was designed to test whether public opinion about an issue was fixed and solid, or if it was likely to change as people learn more and have time and opportunity to deliberate about it. The mushiness index, of course, was the beginning of what Dan would later describe as the difference between mass opinion, people's initial top of the head thinking, and public judgment. They're more considered work through views after they had time and opportunity to deliberate about an issue and its ramifications. This distinction between mass opinion and public judgment has been central not only to public agenda, but to the work of the Kettering Foundation, the National Issues Forums, the Harwood Institute, the FDR group, uh, Steve and Ann are sitting over there, uh, the Co National Coalition for uh, Dialogue and Deliberation, Everyday Democracy in Hartford, Connecticut, my friend Bob Shapiro at Columbia University, who's out here somewhere, uh, and who's on the Public Agenda Board of Directors, Jim Fishkin and the Center for Deliberative Democracy at Stanford University, Yankelovich West, Viewpoint Learning, another organization that, that Dan founded, as well as to the work of countless scholars and researchers uh, around, across the country, around the world. That's, that's how that started. Now, the, uh, and I have another story, but uh, do you want me to tell well, that can, one too? You could save that one. I'll save that one. Yeah, but it'll, you'll get your chance. OK. Go. Good. So the thing that was so amazing about Dan is how he could tell a story. I don't mean a story about something happening, how he could create a narrative. So one time I asked him, I said, you know, it was kind of naive. I said, how did you get to be like such a famous public opinion guy? And, and earn all that money at it. Right, yeah. yeah. And I said, <laughs> I said, was it your brilliance in statistics? And, you know, Dan, Dan was never very impressed with all that sophisticated analysis. He would say, you do the sophisticated analysis when you don't have a result. Uh, and, and he said, my success was I could tell the clients, I could make the data sing to those clients. Uh, somebody later told me, he said, a public agenda report, he said, always reads like a, like a Greek tragedy. <laughs> you know, there's clashing forces of good and evil. And, and so, I mean, he was amazing. So the first time I saw this, we were working one of the very first public agenda studies, the freedom of expression studies. And we were, you know, we did this whole survey and we interviewed a million people. And we went and we had kind of a, like a public opinion report. And we went in to show it to Dan. And he said, mm hmm he said, that's not what your report is about. And he said, it's really about these two concepts of freedom of expression clashing. One is the leader, and we're, yeah, yeah, I guess it was that. And, and, I mean, he just took our whole report just on the spot. I think it was the first he'd heard about it, and reformed it into, of course, what it became. And it was, it was just shocking, but of course, to us. But what, we, what he was doing was making it into a story. So he had a fantastic ability to create a narrative structure to do something. And then he combined that with another skill, which was he could take an example that he would get from Lord knows where and make that example carry so much meaning. So 
one time I was doing a study of all things on the post office. I can't even remember why I was doing that. And I'm going in and talking <laughs> for, for to somebody. For public agenda? Yeah, yeah sort of. Um, <laughs> yes, it was. It was. Um, but, uh, I never saw that one. It was a communication and partly was, you know, post office and that. And so we're presenting, you know, some ideas to somebody. And, and I'm saying my thing. And, and Dan starts talking about a story about a mailman and what he thought. And I'm thinking, where did he get that? <laughs> and months later, I found it was some interviews he did for Larry, uh, where he talked to a, somebody who was a postman, and then just was able to integrate that and used it so beautifully to illustrate his idea. So it was that idea of he could think in the stratosphere and pull huge things together and then illustrate it with such a concrete human experience. It's just yeah. mind boggling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, let's turn for a second from the big ideas and, and, and sort of the brilliance just to the, what was it like to work with the guy? Hmm. Because it was gratifying but challenging in various ways as well, right? Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that I remember is that, you know, Dan did have this incredible uh, ability to, he was just so incisive. You know, things became clear. You know, he would, he would tell you these stories. It was just so clear. Uh, but the, he was not easily satisfied with his own work. So that, you know, you, he would tell you something clear, and you would go like good doobie and write it all up. And I would, you know, polish my grammar and come back. And he would look at it and say, that's not right. And you know, I, you know, I wrote down what you said. Are we doing gaslighting here? You know, I was like, but you know, I, what what I re began to uh, realize and respect is that he really kept working on it. You know, he wanted to. It, it would get better and better and better and better. And you know, it's interesting because he was so brilliant off the top of his head, but he wasn't happy with that. It, he really, really wanted to think things through and have them be the best they could be. And you know, he just had this enormous impracticality that, first of all, his whole life was, we can change the world. You know, <laughs> let's start another institution. But, but he cared so much about this work he was doing. And so you, you but, but I think to engage with that was so painful in a way. So, <laughs> so you'd write something, and you, it was just what he'd said. And, and he'd look at the first page, he said, no, that's not right. <laughs> and you'd say, OK, well, OK, I got that. How about the rest of the other nine pages? I don't want to see it. You know, you know, go back and fix the first page. Because he, he just was so passionate about it. So I actually, uh, I had a reputation for being able to work with him. And I always found him, in a certain way, very easy to work with. But one thing I used to do was, um, the public agenda was here in the Yankel of Scully and White. It was you know, quite a few blocks away. But I would, if I had a question to ask him, I would call his son, who was administrative, and find out when he was walking somewhere. And you know, Dan was always a great walker. He loved to be outside and walk. So I would just show up there when he was going to walk for his dentist appointment or to some other office. And I, Dan, can I walk with you? And he, lo I loved walking with Dan. So we would walk, and I would always have like a question I didn't really care about that I would ask him. <laughs> and if, if, if he was kind of, yeah, yeah, you know, running with it, I'd say, OK. Or, but then you could tell he was, if he was preoccupied with something else. And then I'd save my other question for another walk. Yeah. But, <laughs> but she, you know, you just had to know. You know, you had to pick your moments because, because of that intense passion for what he was doing. Well, just a quick, quick personal story. Um, Dan could sometimes teach in a very subtle way. And um, one time, I remember, he told me a story about, um, he, did, he had done a study for the Shah of Iran. And, <laughs> and he had to uh, present the results. And uh, the, the study about Americans' attitudes toward the Shah, and uh, of course, they were very negative. Um, and the Shah's advisors were terrified that uh, Dan would have to go to Iran to meet with the Shah personally and present the results. And Dan said he, he had no trouble doing that. He said he went and he um, told the Shah what the results were and came out just fine. And the Shah was happy as could be, even though the results were dreadful and said that Americans didn't like what the Shah was doing and so on and so forth. And I think he told me that story because he wanted me to learn he said, I knew how to give 
the client the bad news. I knew how to give the client the bad news. And I think he told me that story because he felt I didn't know how to do that. I had to learn how to do that. And here's an example. It's not, I'm not going to tell you word for word what I did, but if you have bad news to give to the client, don't gloat. Don't gloat about it. You need to be very empathic, and you need to present it in a way that it will be received straightforward, straight from the shoulder, uh, but without any gloating, and uh, uh, take this lesson to heart. And, and I, I tried to, um, sometimes with, with great success and sometimes with lesser success. Um, but I think that's why he, uh, he told me that story. So in terms of that passion that people are talking about, that sort of never say die, never quit kind of a thing, I mean, you know, as many of you know, he was publishing into his 90s and, and founding new centers such as at UCSD into his 90s. I went to visit him last summer, and I kind of, it was a regular thing. I would sort of, it's almost like a pilgrimage to go out and hang out with Dan. Uh, uh, um, once or twice a year for the past seven, eight years. Um, and um, it was a great experience. I mean, you'd, you'd go out and sit on, the, on, his, on his veranda out back of the house, and he had all of these sun hats, and he'd, he'd had a whole collection, and he'd offer you one, and you'd hang out there, and you'd start talking, and you'd get that Dan treatment of, you know, all of a sudden these ideas that you hadn't thought of and wrong, you know, trends that you weren't seeing, and foolish ideas that people were trying. Um, now, the last time I went out was in August, and um, um, he called to cancel the meeting because he, he wasn't feeling well, and he thought he might need to go to the hospital. And I, I said, well, I'm out here. If you need any help, uh, you know, just let me know. And I got a call back, and I ended up driving him to the hospital. Um, and even on the way to the hospital, I mean, it didn't stop. You know, he had this whole idea about community colleges, and you know, he was very concerned about the danger to democracy of diminishing opportunity in the, in the country, uh, um, and the loss of the middle class, and the loss of, of the opportunity to get ahead, for ordinary people to get ahead in their lives. And he thought, that's a much bigger problem than inequality per se, the fact that people are stagnating and not feeling the, the sense of being able to, to move ahead and their kids are going to do well. So that's, that's, that's dangerous. Um, and he had this whole notion about community colleges that he was just, you know, I'm driving him to the hospital, he's talking my ear off. Um, um, and that was the last time I saw him. But again, it's that, that sort of, you know, just churning with, with ideas and solutions uh, um, as, as long as he could. I, we used to say, no more new ideas, Dan. We're still working on the last five. You know, it's going to go. <laughs> So, uh, you know, given the state of democracy today, I just want to hear if there's any reflections before we stop about, you know, what do we take from Dan that's most necessary for what's going on in, in today's America and today's world? What strikes you? Uh, you know, one of the things I just wanted to comment on, and I'll connect it to your question at the end, but uh, I was just always so admiring of the way that Dan... Uh, had these wonderful friendships in his life. Um, you know, we all do. We, 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 these are some of my friends here. We get together, we have dinner, we reminisce, we talk about books we've read, we have a great, great time. Dan did all of that. And then he did, you know, something more. So, like, he goes to Boston Latin School at Harvard with Arthur White, and they found Yankelovich Skelly and White. You know, he meets Sidney Harmon, this a great business executive and uh, entrepreneur, and they get they they start this project on the world, an international project on the world of work in the 1980s. They write a book together, you know, starting with the people. He has his friend uh, Norton Garfinkel, who is here, and had many wonderful times with them. But they start a, a, a the, the Future of Democracy project. They write a book together. United in America, you know, the, about the urgency of finding the vital center of this country. It was, you know, it was more than a friendship. You know, Cyrus Vance, the story I heard is they used to have lunch at the St. Regis and kind of talk about the state of the world, and out of that comes public agenda. Um, and then, you know, as uh, Dan uh, uh, and David, and David used the word, the word I was going to use, which is mind meld. Mm -hmm. You know, these two people meet, and they uh, start you know, setting off sparks at each other. And now we have tens of thousands of, of people across the country, you know, benefiting from what Dan and David 
uh, learned and put together and, and put that. And so the, the, the way that I think about this is Dan had a, an incredible, uh, rich personal life. He had an extraordinarily successful professional life, a writer, a businessman, and all of these things. But it wasn't enough from him. He wanted to help the country. And I just, you know, so many of us, we are satisfied with our own accomplishments. And I, his, his, you know, so many of his friendship, he wanted to help the country. And just a remarkable man. And if there's a key idea behind so many of the things Dan did, it's the difference between an expert leadership perspective and the public perspective. And partly he was so comfortable in you know, the leadership world and the Council of Foreign Relations and Aspen Institute that he really understood how leaders approached a problem. And because of his understanding of the public, he saw the t differences and tensions. And he would say just simple things like, OK, it took leaders like three years to come up with this proposal. And they're surprised they can't sell it to the public in, in one speech. Uh, but it was always that understanding of that divide, those kind of the great divide between those two communities and how to finally try and put them together, I think was his ultimately biggest contribution. I just, you know, the, the big idea, if I may, just take a minute, Will. Mm -hmm. the, the first big project, is, as Jim Immer and uh, Jean said, was a, the public uh, agenda study on freedom of expression. And it, it was a huge study. We interviewed 50 experts, I think Bill Moyers and Floyd Abrams. We did focus groups. We did a, a national survey. But from the outset of the project, Dan said he wanted choices in the final report. Well, when it was finished, you know, Dan, Dan, of course, changed it and, and made it so much better. But it, I thought we had a great study. It was world class with terrific findings. And my background is research. And, and I was thrilled by what we'd come up with. And I was convinced Dan would, too. But we worked on the final report. And I had, I had a problem. I had no idea what Dan was talking about when he, when he said he wanted choices. I did not have a clue. And I said to Gene and Emmer, I said, he wants choices in the report? What in the heck is he talking about? We have, we have great findings here. He's going, to be, he's going to be thrilled. And But Gene and Emmer were wiser than I. They said, look, the first thing Dan's going to do when we give him a draft of the report is he's going to open it up and see if there are choices in it. And if there aren't choices, he's going to ignore the whole study. But if he sees the choices, then he'll engage. So we gave him a draft of the final report. And the, sure enough, First thing Dan did was he opened it up and he looked for choices. Now, the choices we came up with, this was uh, about 1980, yeah. they were pretty half-baked. Because neither, I'll, I'll say, right. neither, yeah. neither Gene nor Emmer had a very clear idea of what Dan meant either. But that didn't matter to Dan. Once he saw we had choices, however imperfect they were, however flawed, however half-baked, then he was able to zero in on the findings, give them his full attention, and with a whole lot of uh, uh, fine-tuning uh, that were typical of Dan, uh, embraced them. And, and, and those two stories, the one I told earlier and this one, pretty much sum up my experience working with Dan. It was like playing chess with a grandmaster. He had a vision, he had concepts that he hadn't fully developed, and he expected the people working with him to help him flesh out his thinking. Sometimes I, I got what he was driving at pretty quickly, and sometimes it took me a year or two and I'd say to myself, now I understand what he means. Now I, now I get it. In hindsight, of course, it's, it's clear that Dan's thinking was evolving over the years. Indeed, as Will points out, it, it, his thinking never stopped evolving. But as time went on, the concept of choice work has been central to both public agenda, also the work of the Kettering Foundation, National Issues Forums, and the work of many other organizations in this country and around the world. OK, well, thank you. Thanks to the panel. Good job. 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 Good